Hi everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I am about to make a pair of late 16th century Venetians. So I'm beginning with this pattern layout right here. You can see this. Um, this is a pattern layout that I'll be using in the next volume of The Modern Maker. Um, it's fairly simple. I mean, it's four panels, two fronts, two backs, a waistband, a fly flap, and there's some excess so that we can do bindings and finishings. <clears throat> this pair is actually going to be quite simple in its construction. It is going to have pockets. Uh, so I'm going to start by doing the layout. And that layout is going to be done with the Bara tape measure. And we'll begin by laying out the fronts and then followed by the back, then the waistband, and the fly flap. Okay? So let's get started. I'll be using two different tape measures for this. I will start with a 35 inch tape measure, which is for the length, and then I will use a 40 inch tape measure, which is for the hip. Now, in actuality, these could just be directly measured off the client and created very easily without even actually having to know what the inch measurement was. I have a full set that are labeled with the inch measurement so that I can just grab what I need when I need it. So the top part of the Venetians is created using only the hip tape measure. That way we know that the crotch depth is scaled according to the person's size and the, the width of the garment scaled according to the person's size. The only thing I need to use the waist measure for at this point is just so that I know how wide to make it across the edge, or, or across the end of the fabric. Okay, let me grab a piece of chalk. So I'll start by going right to the edge of the fabric. This fabric has been torn and carefully folded so that it's nice and clean. And I'm looking at my, uh, my chart right here, my little layout, and it says that the waist has to be M plus three dedos. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this system, the dedo is each of these small increments, which is equal to one forty-eighth of the total length of the tape measure. Okay. So I'm right here at the very edge of the fabric, and I'm going to measure M plus 3. And all I do to measure the 3 is I just swing the end of the tape measure around and uh, place it past the M itself. And that gives me my first mark for the width of the front waist. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the depth of the crotch. And I'll use the hip tape measure for that because the depth of the crotch is connected to the depth uh, or the size of the hip. So the depth of the crotch equals T plus 2. So T plus 2. And I'm just going to make a small little mark so that I know where I am. And then the next measurement to figure out what the crotch extension is, is um, D using the hip tape. So now I have this nicely drawn uh, crotch placement point, and I can draw my line following what I have on my layout. So I'm going to keep it fairly straight right here at the front, okay? And then from here, because it's the front, I'm going to drop it slightly because the waistband is shaped. Those of you who are watching, can you please uh, type something in the chat section to let me know that you can hear me okay? So 
So from here, now I have the drop for the front of the waist. So that's it right now for using the hip tape. I'm going to switch to using the length tape so that I can get the full length of the leg. The full length of the leg using the length tape is three quarters. So I'm just going to lay the edge of the tape right here, matched up with the edge of the fabric, and I'm going to make a mark at triple Q. I'm going to return to my hip tape and I'm going to make a mark from this edge equal to S, one sixth, okay? And that places the out seam because the out seam is curved. If you look at this pattern piece right here, the out seam is curved. Can everyone hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. So there I've just drawn the curved out seam according to what I have here. Now I made a mark on my draft showing where the bottom of that curve could go. I just eyeballed it when I drew it here. So let me try this again with the uh, length tape and make sure that I put it in the right place. It should be two less than M. So M I or I I M is where that curve should go to. So I went a little bit high I'm going to come back out to there and then just blend it right into that out seam. When I cut, I can clean this up a little bit more. So now I want to place the width of the leg opening at the bottom. And for that, it's easy. I just use the hip tape and the measurement is Q. So I'm going to measure straight across to Q. And as shown in my diagram, this needs to be a little bit curved. So I'm just going to draw that in. There's the curve right there. And then the only thing left to do is just to mark the inseam for this pattern piece. So I'm going to do that. And there we are. So I'm just going to put a little F on that so that I know it's the front. So the next thing I'm going to do is scoot the fabric down and I'm going to draw the back of the calzone. Now the shape itself is identical to the front except that we don't have this little downward curve right here. So I've moved the fabric over and I will begin the same way. I will do M plus two. I'm just going to line this right up along the bottom of the previous pattern piece. Okay, and I can just draw a straight line connecting that to my selvage. Then once again I'm going to switch to the hip tape. I'm going to draw TII -I so that I can have my crotch depth and then I will use D so that I can have my crotch extension. And from here 
I can very easily draw this line. So the back crotch is slightly longer than the front crotch, which is what we want, because when a person moves and bends over, it will uh, give a little bit more ease through the seat so that it's more comfortable to wear. So once again, I'm going to switch to my length tape. I'm going to make a mark at the triple Q. Return to the hip tape. The out seam comes to S right there. And my curvature needs to come to here. I'm just going to blend that carefully into place. All right. I'm glad to know the sound is good. Thank you so much. Again, for the leg opening at the bottom, I'm going to open this up to Q right here. And then I will give it a slight curve. And there's my inseam. So the proportion of length to width will look different for every person that you draft for. for here we see the full length is based on his height, but the crotch seems a little bit long. Now, that's not uncommon. Um, it really just depends on... It just depends on your client and their size. Like, larger people are going to have a lower crotch, and smaller people are going to have a much higher crotch. And all of it is connected with their height as well. As long as you get the basic shape relatively clean, all should be well. Okay, now that I have both the front and the back placed, I'm going to move the fabric again and then I'm going to draw the waistband onto the fabric. Now, I have worked with this particular client before, so I actually have a pattern that I have cut in the past for his waistband. So I'm going to go ahead and use that because I know it fits. Okay. So this waistband is just going to be placed right here, nice and clean and out of the way. And you can see the point that's on this waistband. And that will fit into the point that we've cut into the front of the breeches. Okay, the next thing I'm going to draw is the fly flap. Now, fly flaps come and go. Um, there's a point where we don't see any fly flap at all. Part of that has to do with the construction of the trousers in the time period. Breeches tended to have a very large inverted pleat at center front, which hides any kind of closure that's happening at center front. Some of the extant pieces don't have any fly to speak of because they were once created for a cod piece, which covers the opening. But once you reach into the 1590s and into the 1600s, you see this just little wedge-shaped, uh, simple fly flap appear. Now, 
unlike our modern trousers, which have an extension that goes inside beneath a fly, the fly of this time period is actually external, so it's an extension that's on the outside. Place this right here. That's my center line. And I'll use his hip tape to decide how deep I want this to be. And um, according to what I just measured, it should be S. So I'm going to mark S right there. And then the width is going to be O in total. Now there's seam allowance included on this. And it has a slight point at the front. So we're going to give one and a half for the length of the point. This feels a little bit short to me visually, so I'm going to go ahead and give it about half dedo extension at the top, okay? So this is the fly flap. It'll get folded down the center line. This edge gets, uh, uh, the whole thing is folded in half, and then this edge gets sewn to the front waist. And the bottom edge, where the little angle is, will just be closed, clean, turned inside, hemmed, and then the buttonholes will be placed about like this. This fly flap can accommodate four of them comfortably. If you want to have more, you can make it longer. But four is usually about normal, because generally speaking, I will put um, either one or two buttons on the waistband, or in this case, the waistband actually will close edge to edge at the top with eyelets. While I have this garment laying here all nice and clean, I'm going to make marks for my pocket opening. Hmm, I see your question that this looks different from the series of stills that I took for making the other garment. I'm not sure which part you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about the fly flap, it may just be a slightly different shape. This is what I'm working with right now. So the pocket opening along here, I'm going to put the top of the pocket opening two down from the top, and then the opening itself will be S. So I'm making two little marks right there, and I'll make the same marks on the back piece. Ah, square fly flap versus the one with the tapered end. Yeah, they're just it's variations on a theme. I've seen all of them in the extant garments. The close-up photos that I have show a lot of different shapes. Okay. So here are all of my basic pieces. I have waistband, I have fly flap, I have front, I have back. So the next thing that I'll do is I will draw some lines for bias tape so that I can do the finishing around the edges. Generally, on a pair of pants like this, I will put a binding around the top of the waistband and around the leg openings. And uh, usually I'll have a contrasting color for the edges of the pocket. Sometimes I won't have anything at all. It really just depends on my mood at the moment. This pocket, since I'm putting it directly into the seam instead of cutting it into the front of the leg, which is sometimes what I do, uh, I'm not going to put an edging around this particular pocket because it doesn't really need it. I may use a trim to decorate that will go near the pocket, but I'm not doing anything specific for like a welted pocket opening. 
So to conserve the fabric, I'm just going to begin to draw my bias in this area right here, just so that I can keep as much of the yardage as I have for, for uh, perhaps for making the pocket bag itself, or I might make the pocket out of linen. I haven't exactly made that decision yet, and I don't actually have to until the moment that I'm putting the pocket in place. So I'll start here, I'll just eyeball an approximate 45 degree angle. Um, the width can be anything, so frequently I'll just use three fingers to denote it, sometimes I'll use two if I want it to be narrower, or I could also use my ruler right here. And my ruler shows that my three fingers is actually one, two, three and a half dedos of here uh, on this ruler. This ruler is based on the actual standard vada, which is 33 American inches. And each little dedo is 1 48th of that. Okay, now I'm going to move the fabric down and get the remaining of the binding, and I'm only gonna I'm going to stop right here at the bottom of the back leg so that I don't use up the rest of that textile. Okay, I'm ready to cut this out, so I'm just going to begin by cutting off the excess fabric. I measured out two yards of fabric for this pair of breeches, and I don't need all this excess. I really could have gotten it out of a yard and a half, but I cut two yards just so that I could be cautious. Generally, before I cut, I will... Uh, pin in place just to keep the layers from shifting while I'm cutting. Old school tailors would probably do this with basting, um, but I don't want to take that kind of time on this video, so I'm going to go ahead and pin like normal people. The bias I'm not so worried about. And just so you know, this amount of bias, while it doesn't look like much of its layout here, is actually double this amount because there's two layers that are being cut. It's way more than I actually need, so I can save it for use on another garment.
Okay, so I have my scissors. I'm just gonna start cutting. This edge was cut along the fold, so I'm going to separate the layers now. And then I will also, since I'm right here, I'm going to clip the notches for my pocket opening. This one. Again, I will split my out seam, clip the notches for my pocket placement, and then also because I have a fly flap that's going in, I'm going to mark the placement of the bottom of it. So I'm going to mark this at S plus 1 because that gives me room for the extra that I put at the top of the fly flap when I cut it out and it also gives room for there to be a seam allowance that takes place. Okay, so I marked a notch for that. So my front's cut out. And then let me just quickly cut out my fly flap. Okay, that's done. Waistband is next. I'm going to clip the notches to mark the side seam. Okay. And finally, I'll quickly cut out the bias tape.
I'll worry about putting these together later. So out of the, that cutting, this is how much scrap I have left. Very, very little, nothing that I can really use for anything. So as far as I'm concerned, it was a pretty clean cut. So now that I have all of these bits prepared, the next step, I basically have to cut the same thing two more times, but out of an interlining fabric, which is a medium weight linen, and then a lining fabric, which is a lightweight linen. So let me get those. This will happen really quickly. I'm just going to take the pieces that I've cut out of the main body and uh, just pin them down onto the linen and cut around them. Um, the waistband, however, I will cut the interlining from a much heavier linen, it's from a drapery weight linen versus a clothing weight linen. So here's the interlining, just plain white linen, uh, you know, more accurate for the time period would be an unbleached linen, but uh, this is what my linen supplier has very quickly and easily and inexpensively, so this is what I get. So the parts that need to be interlined really are just the uh, just the body panels, the main body of the pants. And just like I did when I cut the exterior, I have to open the out seam. And in this case, I set the piece in a little bit farther so that I could just trim it instead of having to slice on the, on the fold. And then I'm going to put my notches here once again so that I know where to match up for the pocket.
Okay, the next thing will be to cut the lining. And then while I have the lining available, I'm going to also cut the pocket bags. If you'll excuse me for just a minute, I'm going to get a glass of water. Okay. So exactly the same process here. I'm going to leave all the layers together because what happens when you cut out like this is you end up making the lining slightly larger just by a fraction of an inch all the way around because you're visually cutting slightly to the outside of these pieces. And that just means that the lining won't affect the hang and shape of the exterior layer. While I have this piece of fabric here, I'm just going to turn it into a pocket bag. I don't need the pins in anymore because I'm done cutting with this piece. So I'm just going to take them out now rather than leave them 
in and give an opportunity to get stabbed later. Because honestly, who needs that? going to cut the other piece and I'm going to treat it exactly the same. And I'm going to, uh, instead of trying to create the pocket bag in the same way, I'm just going to grab the other pocket bag and lay it down and cut it out so that they all match. Just making sure that I've clipped the notch for the fly flap as well, because that's where the lining needs to stop also. All right, and now I hope that this piece is big enough. It might not be, let's see. I don't think it is. No, and I don't feel like piecing a waistband today. Ugh. 
This is just a scrap of this canvas that I had lay, laying around. Oh no, we're interlining the waistband. This is the waistband interlining that I'm cutting right now. Oh no, <laughs> I just realized that I cut the lining incorrectly. So I'm going to rewind, I'm going to do that again. Thank God I have more of that fabric. The lining is supposed to actually be cut longer than the exterior because the lining goes all the way to the top of the waistband. Unlike modern trousers where the waistband is just turned down and it encases the entire upper edge, because there's so much fullness in the trousers, the lining of the waistband goes to the top. It kind of reduces fullness and makes it way more comfortable to wear. So I have to pull some more lining out and lay it out and recut the lining. Please bear with me. <laughs> this is why I always overbuy fabric. I suppose that's also one of the uh difficult parts of doing things like this live. People get to see my mistakes as well as my triumphs.
you'll notice that I'm just cutting straight across the top uh, at the front because once the waistband is included then the little dip is no longer present so I just cut straight it's almost the same shape as the back Okay. Now we are completely cut. Okay, I'm going to rearrange the work area for a second. So the next step will be pinning the exterior onto the interlining and then I'll take it over to the sewing machine and I'll stitch around the exterior edge. I'm going to do that with all the main pieces that need the interlining um, and we'll just keep going from there. I'm going to set the lining pieces aside because I won't need them for a little bit. So the way I avoid making two lefts or two rights of any body panel is I lay them first on top of each other just as I cut them out. So I have two layers of silk that are right side together, two layers of linen that are right sides together, and then I just remove the top layer of silk flip it around and put it on the bottom. So now I have this sandwich so that I have the right sides are out and I know that I have a left and a right. So I'm going to roll one of them up so that I don't misplace.
I mean, yeah, machine basting around the edge is actually a lot faster than hand sewing. Part of uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do machine sewing on this piece instead of hand sewing also is so that I can get a lot more of it in in a single day. I mean, I know I'm pretty fast with hand sewing, but uh, I think that it's a lot more interesting to watch somebody doing something a little more quickly than it takes to hand sew. That skirt was fun when I streamed it the last couple of days, but I uh, feel like this is a little bit of a different animal. Oh, don't worry about the interruption, seriously. I mean, I'm just here working in my studio. If I didn't have the stream going, I'd probably get distracted by Facebook anyway. So as I'm putting the pins in, I'm making sure that I smooth the fabric out before I place a pin, just to make sure that the exterior fabric is just lightly stretched onto the interlining. And by doing that, I know for sure that the interlining is a little bit full and it will never be pulling at the exterior. It's always a concern. I mean, in, in the form of a doublet, it's one of the reasons why we do all of that basting, which never sticks around. I could very easily do that basting on this as well. But again, for the sake of speed, I'm doing the machine, the, the mostly, mostly hand, but partially machine made method. Okay, that one is prepared. So I'm going to set that over here on the sewing machine and I'll prepare the second one. Hello to whomever just joined us. Thank you. Okay, so my back panels are done. I'll move on to the front. So once again, I'm going to set the lining aside and then I'm going to do my special flip technique here so that I know I have a right and a left. Then I'm going to roll one of those up and set it aside and now I can pin the interlining in place.
Okay, that's one front. Okay, the second front is complete. Now the waistband. Okay, waistbands are done. I'm going to cut an interlining for the fly flap as well. In reality, I only need one layer of the fly flap. I could have waited to the very end and cut this single layer from a scrap to conserve fabric, but it was just faster to do a double layer.
Okay. Everything is cut. Everything's been pinned in place. I'm ready to go to my sewing machine and just run around the outside edge of all of these pieces to secure them in place. And I really only do about an eighth of an inch around the outside edge. I don't go as big as a quarter because some of these seam allowances can be quite small and I don't want any of the machine sewing to show at all. And if I were doing it by hand, it would be an eighth of an inch in from the edge as well. I have all of my bias here, which I'm also going to stitch together while I'm sitting at the machine. The trick to being really efficient is to batch all of your tasks. So you'll notice I did all of my cutting at once for the most part, and then I did all of the pinning at once, and then I will do all of the stitching I can at once, and then I will do a little bit of decoration, and then I will go back and do a little bit more assembly, but every bit of it uh, I try to keep, um, keep like tasks grouped together just for efficiency. So I'm going to move the computer here so you can see the work at the sewing machine a little bit better. I'm done with the drafting and layout so I can put my tapes away and my rulers and stuff. I'll start by putting together the bias since it's the top of the pile. I'm going to use a fairly small stitch. And one of the things that is true about historic clothing is it doesn't really seem like they gave a, a care to the directionality of the fabric when it came to putting their edgings together. So I tend to just grab willy-nilly and if I can spot a place where I need to be certain of the directionality of the fabric, then I'll just do it. But for the most part, I don't really think about it too much because the appearance is so minimal in the final binding, uh, it just becomes a little bit unnecessary to fight that battle.
so you can see I've got one, two, three, and one eighth yards just from those little scraps. These, uh, these are all kind of too inconsistent for me to want to use. But three yards of trim just to bind the top edge and the leg openings is way more than enough. So I'm going to call that good. And then here, just lay this in the machine. One eighth of an inch around all edges. As soon as a piece is sewn, I take it off my sewing table because I don't want to waste time knocking it off onto the floor. I know, this is super entertaining. Thank you for your patience. I'm trying to go a little faster.
Okay, all the interlining is complete. So, since I'm here at the machine, once again, because I want to make sure that I just do everything that I possibly can, I'm going to go ahead and stitch together the lining. Use a slightly smaller stitch. Which one is the front? marking the fly placement. Now with something like a lining on a pair of trousers, especially because I know he's going to do fencing in them, you want to make sure that you stitch the crotch seam. If you're sewing by hand, you want to back stitch it with a really strong silk thread or a heavy linen thread. If you're sewing by machine, just make sure that you stitch the crotch seam twice. It really helps with durability and it frees up the worry when you know they're going to be doing lunges while wearing clothes. Okay, that's that. Now we'll do the inseam. And with this, just because I want to do everything I can while I'm at the machine, I'm just going to, because it's linen, I'm going to finger press the seam allowance open for my intersection of the inseam. Gonna throw in a single pin to keep it aligned. inseam is now sewn. The inseam I don't sew twice because I'm not as worried about it breaking as I am the out or the crotch. So now all I got to do is stitch the out seams.
Right. That is assembled. So, if I were doing a plain pair of Venetians, the next step would be to assemble the exterior. But because uh, for this particular client, I'm doing a little bit of decoration. The next step then is to put the placement line on, cut out the strips for decoration, apply them, give them the little pinks, which is just small cuts, and then I can put the pockets on the panels and then sew the panels together. So I'm just using the width of my ruler for these strips. Okay, there's four of them. Okay, that was easy. Those are prepared. Now, I'm going to take my panels here and I'm going to clean them up because when you cut the interlining out and then you stretch the layers on and you put them in place, uh, the, the linen grows a little bit. So I want to clean up my edges so that I don't get distracted and think that I'm stitching an edge that I'm not.
so as I trim each piece, I'll put placement marks for my line of trim, which I'm doing at two finger widths from the cut edge. Okay. So there's one. I'm doing it on each quarter panel. So far, from layout to this point of putting trim on, we're about 90 minutes from the moment that we start, well, from the moment that I activated the video. So, not even quite 90 minutes, just to get about halfway through the construction, the main construction. Now, the details like putting in eyelets and binding and finishing, that takes a little bit of time. Because so much of that work is done by hand, it takes extra time. Okay, that was front number two. Back piece number one. <laughs> well, even the trim that I'm going to put on is going to be partially sewn by machine. The first pass gets done by machine, the second pass gets done by hand. You'll see. It's uh, a nice little piece of applied silk trim. The only stitching that will be visible is the hand stitching.
So with this bias, all I'm doing is going through, because I stitched it the way I needed to so that everything was aligned properly, but sometimes that means the seam allowances were different widths. So I'm going to go through and cut all the allowances down to a quarter of an inch and trim them. So the next step is going to be my very first visit to the ironing table so that I can press all of these bias seam allowances open, give a once over to the edges of the main body panels. Um, actually, no, I'm going to save that for later because I don't want to erase the chalk marks that I just put on it. But also take the trim that I cut out, the silver stuff and uh, give it a good press and fold it in half and prepare it to be sewn on. Going to go to the ironing table now. Uh, it'll take just a second to move the computer. Bear with me. It'll take just a minute for the iron to heat up. With these, uh, with the highly curved out seam, I find it important to press from both ends. I don't try to slide the garment down. I just flip it around so that I can press into the depth of the curve. And then I'll go for the other out seam, and then I'll do the crotches and the inseam.
This one I have to scoot it down a little bit because it's the crotch and there's really no way to get it from the other side. Okay, lining is pressed, so now I can just set that aside since it's ready to go into the pants now. How fast was that, right? Next, I'll press open all the seams on my bias tape. And in about 10 minutes, I'm going to go to a break, catch people up on Facebook, take photos, post them in the album, um, do a little promo for the next segment, which should start at uh, probably around 4 o'clock. If you have questions up to this point, now would be a good time to ask. So now that the bias tape is all joined, it's all pressed open, I'm just going to fold it right in half and press.
Okay, that part's done, and now we do the same thing with this. We fold this in half. Okay, and then our fly flap. So the next step, which I'm going to do after I get back from break, is we start to apply the trim. Now these are just cross grain cut strips of silk. I'm going to line the cut edge up with the mark and I'm going to stitch a quarter of an inch away from the cut edge. Just going to do a run line on the sewing machine. 
And then once that's in place, then I fold it back over itself and then hand stitch the, the other edge down, which is a fold, so it'll be very nice and clean. And then once that's done, then I go through with the razor blade and I actually make tiny little cuts all the way through it so that it's decorative. And once that's done, then it's pockets, then it's assembly, then the easy part is over and we get into the hard stuff. So thank you so much for watching this segment. Um, I will see you back here at 4 o'clock.